is the Rebel Author Podcast, where we talk about books, business, and occasionally bad words. Hello, Rebels, and welcome to episode 236 of the Rebel Author Podcast. Today, I'm joined by Michelle Glogovac, and we are talking all about how to pitch podcasts. But first to the comments and on the Michael Chatfield episode, a Mac descendant said, your low key intro clearly shows how much rest you need. (laughs) When you present online like the PWA Romance Week, you get the thrill of sharing without the drain of face to face interactions. Take care of yourself. Yeah, I mean, that's one of the reasons that I love being on stage as well, because you don't get so much of the the one to one. Don't get me wrong. I also do love um, a bit of the one-to-one. It's just that whenever I seem to go out of the house to these one-to-one things, it's a a huge amount of interaction in one go. So unlike, you know, like a a, a friend dinner or like a a kid's play thing for an hour or two in the afternoon at a weekend, it's like people all day, every day for three days straight, you know? Uh, So... Yeah, the uh, conferences tend to slay me. I am feeling a lot better uh, this week. That said, (laughs) I did the Kickstarter fulfillment yesterday. Oh my goodness me. Huge shout out and thank you to AP Beswick and Cara Clare, who, uh, what AP uh, drove, uh, God knows how far, about three hours, I think, uh, to come down and help. And Cara drove an hour to uh, come to Book Vault and they both helped me and they were incredible. Uh, I also had my mama and... uh, uh, two of the chaps from Book Vault as well, and it took <laughs> a team of seven <laughs> four hours to uh, get all of the books signed, shipped, and packed. Obviously, I mostly did the signing, and everybody else did the hard labor of uh, packing all the boxes. I have learned quite a few lessons about what not to do um, and about how much. Um, The thing is, I feel like I was preparing for the Kickstarter day for weeks. I, you know, I was signing. It took me like three evenings to sign cards to certificates, sorry, to number them was like another two evenings or three evenings. I can't even remember now. It took me two nights to make all of the boxes. You know, I did all of this by myself. It took me three or four evenings to emboss all of the stickers. So, I I mean, I spent hours and hours and hours and yet it still took a team of seven people to pack all those boxes now this tells me a few things it tells me that I made it too complicated I'm very very good at doing that so my wife tells me uh but also I you know it's very difficult for me because I really like the attention to detail that I paid uh to the kickstarter and to the little details in it but also um it was a fuck load of work <laughs> to be perfectly honest and um i just don't know if i can do that next time i need to find another way just to make things a little bit more efficient um and certainly the signing and the stuff that we do on the day i need to make that a lot less complicated and yeah I mean, there's lots of things that we've talked about that we're going to do differently for next time. So I will just try and make it more efficient, especially because, you know, theoretically, the second Kickstarter could potentially be even bigger. And if it's even bigger, (laughs) it's even more to organise. So, uh, yeah, I just need to have a little thinky think, thinkaroo about how I structure it, how I can simplify it. Uh, whilst still delivering what I want to deliver, which was the unique sort of uh, attention to detail and thought, I suppose, that went into it. I really spent a lot of time thinking about how I could make it meaningful. Um, So I don't want to lose that. Anyway, that is enough on the Kickstarter. So in terms of other things I have been doing, I have been changing accountants. That has been quite complex i've had quite a few accounting issues uh with the sh- i've just it's it's too complicated to go on to on the podcast but shifting bank accounts you know growing business it all requires a little bit more attention to detail on numbers which are not my favorite things to do so that has been somewhat of a pain in the ass over the last few uh, weeks I have also been outlining at last books two and three and uh, 
I am not a huge fan of outlining, but it is very necessary for me to write quickly. And I'm finding it quite difficult because normally I do one book, then I draft the book, then I edit the book, then I publish the book. This time I'm trying to outline two books. And I think I've come to the realization that I'm only going to be out able to outline so much of the third book and I will have to take a quick pause for a day or two just to reassess the outline before I then start writing book three because my intention is to write them both back to back. Now um, the reason I'm finding that difficult is because I don't know what I don't know, I haven't written book two and even though I have an outline new stuff comes up all the time when I'm drafting. It's also been difficult because I have had quite a gap now from writing. The last time I wrote a book was before Christmas. It's now the end of March. So my brain is a little bit groggy and I'm trying to dredge up those skills in outlining and <laughs> it's always painful, I'm not gonna lie. But I'm so excited to get back to drafting, uh, hopefully next week. Well, not hopefully. <laughs> I have to start writing next week. <laughs> uh, so, in more personal exciting news, I have uh, signed a deal with Podium to bring the House of Crimson Hearts and the that whole series to the Kingdom of Immortal Lovers series into audio. So I'm super excited. We're doing some prep in the background for that. And we have also started planning our New Zealand trip. We are going to be in New Zealand for three weeks. I don't yet know what I'm going to do about the podcast. I'm pretty sure I'll continue. I'm, there might just be no intros for a couple of weeks. I'm not, I'm not entirely sure just yet. I don't really want to take my podcast mic with me, but I will if I need to. And three weeks feels like too long of a time period to um, not have intros on the show. Uh, so... I'm thinking about that planning and we've we've enlisted the help of a state an, an estate agent <laughs> a travel agent to help organize the uh, trip we've had lots of input from friends we're going to be doing all of the things swimming with dolphins glowworm caves um, whale watching uh, sailing around the fjords uh, Hobbiton all of the you know classic touristy things that you can think of we are going to do so I am super excited about that and for the um, the the story input and fodder now that said <laughs> in order to get to that point I've got three books to write I have already shifted my plan I was intending to write three full-length books but I'm not going to do that the book I'm releasing at Christmas is a novella and um, therefore I'm going to write the the last two books in the trilogy and then the novella and I'm going to run the second Kickstarter all before I go and the the book the third full book that I was going to write before I'm now going to write in September which you know I'll be totally honest when I used to change my plans like that it would cause me to have quite a tantrum and I'd lose a couple of days to being raged up but you know yay therapy <laughs> yay coaching I'm a different person now I'm able to pivot without having a complete emotional breakdown. So I'm quite proud of that. All right, enough of my waffling on. Okay, the, re the Rebel of the Week this week is Delilah. Delilah says, I thought I'd share a rebel story about my cat, Martini. While I was living in a college town, I had this troublemaker boyfriend who always wanted to go out every night. As a 20-something introvert, I, pa uh, I participated in plenty of nightlife. Some might say way too much. One night, I believe it was a Wednesday night. I told him I wasn't leaving the apartment unless I I'd be returning with a cat. He was like, bet. Uh, on the online marketplace, Craigslist, every other night, sorry, every other post we saw was about a sweet little tortoiseshell kitty about six, six months old. Someone saw their neighbour kicking her. <gasps> oh my God. And they marched up and asked if they could have her. There's a little rebel story within a rebel story for you. They took her home, but their parents were allergic. We drove 45 minutes away to pick her up. I didn't have a pet carrier, but she huddled up with me the whole ride back, purring as loud as a chainsaw. Literally, how do those tiny bodies rev so loud? I, I'm actually still, I feel sick to my stomach and I'm really cross and I would like to kick whoever that person was um, 
three times as hard as they kick the cat. I'm really, I really fucking cannot, abhor, I just abhor animal cruelty. Like it's, it, I just, I'm, I'm really cross. I need to like calm myself down. <sighs> okay, fast forward in time. The troublemaker boyfriend shows some nasty colors. Every night, Martini would pee on his clothes. <laughs> karma even though she never had trouble using the little box in the end i ditched the boyfriend and kept the cat (laughs) of course you did (laughs) martini is 10 now and as rebellious as ever oh and i still didn't go to the party that night oh i love it i can't believe somebody kicked a cat like what is wrong with people (sighs) I, i get so mad about this stuff but um i'm gonna move on before i spend 60 minutes ranting about humans that i don't like (laughs) If you'd like to be a rebel of the week, please do send in your story. It can be any kind of rebellion and we are always in need. You can email your rebel story to Becca over on rebelauthorpodcast at gmail.com. Welcome and a huge thank you to new patrons, Joe, Jennifer, Shelby and Sheena Ager. A big thank you uh, to all my existing patrons. If you would like to support the show and get early access to all of the episodes, as well as bonus content, then you can from as little as $2 a month by visiting patreon.com forward slash Sasha Black. Now, just to make a comment. Last week, I announced that uh, the new classes for the masterclass were on voice and uh, long-term career. After I announced those internally within the Patreon system, I realized that I was getting a little too close to burnout and that I needed to pull back. So I decided to put a pause on the classes. Then my amazing patrons uh, turned around and said, well, what if we level up the classes? So the way that we're gonna work for at least the next class um, and uh, essentially, potentially, the the rest of the year i'm not entirely sure yet is that um one so for those people who have been in the classes for a while they are going to implement all of the lessons that i have been teaching over the last three years two years and somebody is going to host the class i'm going to have a one-on-one session with them so that the class still uh you know implements all of the same teaches the same techniques essentially um and i will also read the book and still deconstruct deconstruct it so that i can add anything that's been missed but the um you guys basically are going to host the classes uh my intention is you know to teach a quarter to half of the classes still over the course of the year um but it might be that i teach one then one of you guys teach one then i teach one and then you and, and then one of you guys teach one and it's essentially just so that i don't burn out basically so that is the plan for the next uh, at least one class and hey maybe the plan will change again but uh, i am i'm having a break on this class at least and then uh, we'll review again afterwards this episode is sponsored by pro writing aid but rather than me tell you all about why i love pro writing aid i'm going to let lynn tell you all about why she uses and loves pro writing aid pro writing aid isn't just for your manuscript don't get me wrong it's great for that but it's also for your website content, your newsletter, and your social media posts. You can copy and paste any text into the web editor or use one of its many software integrations so you can edit anything and everything you ever type. Because let's face it, you can't really copy edit your own work. You miss something. And I, for one, am fed up of crafting my messaging, hitting tweet, and immediately spotting a typo. There's nothing left to do then, but curse the Twitter gods for not giving us an edit button. ProWritingAid is an editing tool for formal reports to Instagram posts. Not only does it help with catching those annoying typos, but it flags when I've slipped into using passive voice, and it suggests fixes and explains the problem so that I can learn for the future and write better content. Hello and welcome to the Rebel Author Podcast. Today, I'm joined by Michelle Glogovac. Michelle is the podcast matchmaker, TM, a podcast publicist, author of How to Get on Podcasts, and host of the award-winning podcast, My Simplified Life. She works with entrepreneurs, authors, and experts uh, to hone their storytelling abilities, grow their businesses, and elevate them as thought leaders. 
Michelle is a wife, mum of two, stepmum of two, and a fur mum too. <laughs> she has her BA and MS in law and is the founder of um, plus CEO uh, of the MLG Collective. That was a tongue, that, that felt like a tongue twister at the end there. <laughs> <laughs> that was a lot <laughs> it was a lot it's a very comprehensive bio I'm very impressed thank you for thank coming you. on <laughs> <laughs> thank you for having me I'm excited to be here um well sure we, let's dive into a little bit more about your background like that is a big bio and that's you know you've done a lot of things from law to being a a, a, a I guess a kind of coach in a way now um working with entrepreneurs and uh you know, CEO as well. So talk me through your journey. Like, how did you get to where you are? <laughs> it's twisted. Uh, <laughs> I, I love a wanted, twisted story. <laughs> yeah, I wanted to be an attorney since I was five. I took a briefcase to kindergarten. No, uh, I love it. I did, yes. I, I would borrow my mom's suits. Like, she'd have the skirt suit. And so I'd hike this the skirt literally up over my chest so that it would fit. Uh, and I would wear that like on free dress day. And so I wanted to be an attorney and I don't know why, but it just stuck with me. And even colleges, I looked who has a law major. So that was how I really based where I went to school. But in school, I needed a part-time job because it cost money and I could walk to the airport and they were hiring. So I worked at the general aviation terminal and when I graduated from college, they gave me a salary and benefits. And I said, well, that means I don't have to move back home. I'm good. And 18 years later, I was still in corporate aviation, selling jet fuel to flight departments, meeting celebrities. It was a very cool job. But once you have kids, you're like, oh, well, what's the world going to be like for them? And what is my job doing that's making it a better place? And I was then luckily laid off while they were still babies at home. They're a year and three weeks apart. So they were literally babies together. And it was at that point that I said, okay, what can I do to really better the world for their future? And I had already, I'd started law school. I had a miscarriage in law school. And so I said, forget this, like, I want to focus on family. So I had the two kids. After having the two kids, the law school came back and said, you still have all these units. If you want, we now have a master's program. It'll take you less than a year to finish. And so I did that. And that's why I have my master's in it, because otherwise I'm like, well, that was wasted money and time. And it was while I was laid off that a friend from my birthing class said, there's this life and business coach. She's launching a podcast. You're trying to figure out what you want to do. Maybe this would be something you want to listen to. And I had no idea how to listen to a podcast in 2018. <laughs> I found the purple button on my iPhone. I knew what a podcast was, but I'd never listened to one. And Why so would you know? Why would you know? You could never listen. Yeah, yeah I, I was like, I knew of it, but how, I don't know how you listen to these things. Uh, and so I started listening and this woman was saying, we all have a purpose and a passion. I was like, yes, what is mine? <laughs> and I started posting on Instagram that, you know, I'm listening to this podcast and this is what she says. <laughs> I don't know what it means for me, but I'm trying. And she reached out to me and said, you obviously like what I'm putting out there. Do you want to pitch me to be on other shows? I was like, wait, this is a thing. Yes, I will pitch you. And I'm one of those people that if I'm going to do something, I have to know everything there is about it. I do the same thing with my clients now. Like, I want to know everything about you. So I started to produce podcasts. I learned how to edit. I hate editing. So I figured that out quickly. But I learned, you know, how do you repurpose a show and how do you write show notes and all of these things that go into it. So then I eventually launched my own show, but I realized quickly that I love pitching clients to be on shows. The production part was like, no, it's not really my passion, but my purpose was to share the stories of others on this wonderful platform that is free for everyone to listen to and to be inspired, motivated, and educated. And to me, that was a way to change the world and make it a better place for my kids. So that is how we come to you today and what I've done. That's an amazing story. Nobody likes pitching. How did you fall in love with this? Like, literally, <laughs> nobody likes pitching for themselves. Like, I, like, how do you feel about pitching for yourself? You know, it's hard for me just as it's hard for anybody else. Uh, I totally understand when someone says, I don't know what to talk about. You know, is it me? I go through the same exact feelings, emotions, quandaries. And yet when I talk to someone else, it's much easier for me to pull out 
This is what's interesting about you. This is what you should speak on. So I find it very easy because I also love hearing the stories. And then I truly become my client's number one fans. I've been told that some of my pitches are too good because I'm... It, no joke. Somebody was like, oh, you know, it, it sounded like you really liked your client. I'm like, yeah, because I really do. <laughs> I don't pitch people I don't like. <laughs> Have you ever thought about working with people who are so like I, I I hear that you're saying that you work with them at the end where like maybe they have a book already, but they don't know how to then take that next step. Do you ever work with people like slightly before they've written the book, like where they're still trying to work out like, OK, so the reason that I ask that is because um, selfishly, uh, obviously, I already have a nonfiction brand and I already have a fiction brand, but. I love motivational speaking and I'm still trying and I spoke on stage in 20 books Vegas to like 1500 authors or whatever it was fucking loved it need more of that it was like crack to me um and uh not many people like stepping on stage and I came off the stage and was like right I need 5,000 people now but I don't know what I want to talk about so like how and uh, already I'm off script here but how do you work with people at that point, like before they've written the book that is their thing to work out what it is that they want to speak on or, or become a thought leader on. It's really like a big therapy session where I say, what is it that you want? You know, tell me what is the future that you want? Mm. Who is it you want to attract? And we really talk about all of that. I've had clients cry in their sessions with me. So that's why I compare it to therapy because I also say, you know, what have you done? Share with me, just as I shared with you my story right now, what has your story been? And don't leave out the details. Like you can tell me how you were born and we will start from there. We will see, you know, what is it that, oh, that part in your childhood has really led you to over here and doing this and why you're doing it. So now what do you want to do with that? So it, it's really discussing what do you see your future you know do you want to be a motivational speaker do you want to be the tony robbins you know but like the good part um yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah you know do you yeah. do you want that big personality but yeah you know, like even he's confused because now he's writing about investments so that makes no sense to me yeah. but you know what is it that you want what is it yeah. that you love talking about I mean, it's for me, it's, yeah, okay, okay, that's interesting. I'm going to go away and think about it because for me, it's a bit like a hybrid of like Glennon Doyle, um, Elizabeth Gilbert and Mel Robbins, I would say, mm -hmm. like some concoction of those three would probably be where I would want to to hover. But yeah, yeah, ah, ah, okay. <laughs> well, we are here to talk about podcast pitching and I know that lots of authors listening really struggle. Like they all would like to pitch themselves. And actually, I think a lot of pitching a podcast is also relevant to pitching other things, be it, mm -hmm. um, I don't know, uh, a book talker live something or other or, you know, right. whatever. So how do we pitch? <laughs> what is the structure of a good pitch? The first thing is not to pitch the book. It's to pitch you, the author, because nobody's interviewing the book. And I get pitched all the time for my own show, especially from publicists at publishing houses who are just telling me all about the book. And I'm like, that's great. But can the person who wrote the book have a conversation with me? Yeah. Like, what is it that makes them interesting? Oh, my God. I never realized that that is why I say no to so many people. Like, I'm like, why? This is so I don't get care. <laughs> I don't care. Yeah. Like, what are you, what am I going to ask you about? That's what I want to know. I'm like, what am I going to ask you so that it's interesting for my audience? Because I only care about delivering interesting conversations for my audience. That is what I want to do for them. So yeah, like, and when you like, and I, so <laughs> confession, when I started this podcast, I used to read the book for every single episode. And then I got really fucking busy and I cannot do it. So I got really good at skimming or like looking for the details. But like, I don't, if you pitch the book, I have no choice. You are giving me a job to do. Right. Basically. It's a, it's a big job. It's hours yeah. long job. Yeah. Yes. Because I read the book of everybody that I have on my show as well. And it's stressful because I also read the book of every client that I have. 
And to me, that's more important though, because you're paying me. So I'm going to read your book, but to be on the show too, to me, it's a way of asking then, well, what part of you is in the book? Mm. But that's not something that you need to read the book beforehand to find out. Uh, but we're not, pit we're not, going to interview the book. You know, I want to know about the person. And I always say to clients and to authors in general of let us get to know you and fall in love with you. Because if we fall in love with you and the way you speak, then we'll love the way you write. And then we'll go buy the book. And it doesn't matter if it's an author or someone who's selling a service or a product, the same thing goes. So that's why it's important to pitch you, the person, what is your story? What is your background? What pivots have you had? You know, you can bring in the writing part of what are your writing rituals? Do you do something quirky that no one else does? You know, and nobody has the same rituals because I have asked every author, you know, do you light the candle? Do you go in the garden? Do you write in the basement? Are you writing at night in the morning? They're all different things. You know, how did you come up with the sex scene? I asked an author for the first time that just the other day. I'm like, so let's talk about that. Like, where were you writing this? And what did your husband say afterwards? Because I want to know this. And now, now that it. I've read enough, I'm like, I am now making assumptions about authors and what's <laughs> going on based on how they're writing their little spicy scenes. And in some cases, I'm like, I feel sorry for your partner. And other ones, I'm like, <laughs> yes, you are in a happy marriage. Congratulations. Oh. Or you're just fantasizing. But these are things that are fun to talk about that, you know, allow us to get to know you and what we can expect in your book. So don't pitch the book, pitch these fun types of angles and let us get to know you. Oh, I love that so much. So, okay, so in terms of like the the structure, so you said don't pitch the book, pitch you. Right. So how does somebody approach formatting like a, an email or a conversation or a whatever to try and get onto a podcast? The first thing is to get the host's name right. Uh, yes, but you'd be surprised. Uh, oh, no, get trust me. Name. <laughs> get their yeah. name right. Uh, and go listen to an episode or two before you even start the email. Listen to an episode or two. Tell the host what episode you listen to and do not make it the la last one because that's lazy. Really scroll through the episodes if you don't already avidly listen and pick one to listen to and tell them why it resonated with you. What is it that you took away from listening to this guest? What lit you up? What did you learn to show that you truly have listened? Go look at their Instagram page. Go look at their website. Pull out a fact from the host bio and relate to that. I've done that and I've landed myself an interview when I was pitching an actual client. So, you know, if you connect on a personal level that shows you're not simply copying and pasting, that is going to win above everyone else right away. The next one is to share a two or three sentence bio of yourself. <clears throat> Excuse me, hyperlink your name. Make sure that there's no homework given to the host where they have to go Google you. Hyperlink to your website. Offer up, this is the knowledge, this is the education. This is what I'm going to share with the audience that they need to hear from and why I'm the expert. But don't put your whole bio because that'll be in your media kit. And then offer up some sample topics that you can speak on. And again, don't add everything that's from your media kit. Take two or three that are most applicable to that show and plug it in. And then wrap it up with, here are some places I've recently been interviewed. Name the podcast and hyperlink again to them. Do as much as you can so that everything's in that one email. It's not massively long, but at the same time, it houses everything you need and attach your media kit that has your full bio, your headshot, all of the places you've been. I create a Spotify playlist for all of my clients. So every podcast that they've been on, it's one link It's and it's on the media kit too. So you just click on the one link. Oh and then, my God, that is amazing. And I'm definitely going to get my virtual assistant to do that. What a <laughs> fucking brilliant idea. That is incredible. Oh my, oh my God. <laughs> I can't get over that. That's genius. You're a genius. That's oh, amazing. Thank you. And you can add that on your LinkedIn profile too, because if whatever your current job is, 
it, this is kind of relatively new, go to that job on your LinkedIn profile and then click on media and you can put the link to your Spotify playlist there too. So now everybody can see it. Yeah, that is fantastic. I never would have thought of that. Um, one of the things that I love most is when people give me the topics or the questions, like or, or topics become questions, right? So the thing that I... When I first started, the thing I found most difficult was creating the questions. Like, and I'm very structured because I am definitely an introvert and I definitely struggle to be spontaneous. I'm much better at that now, 200 and whatever episodes in, but I had to always come up with questions in advance, which is why I had to read every single book back cover to cover. Now mm. I'm a lot better and I'm a, I can see through to see what it is that I need to ask and now they're more of a you know a, a, a um, template to a p- pitching off point to, to have a conversation um, but without doubt that one bit for me if people do that nine times out of ten I'll say yes nine times out of ten because that is the hardest bit I, it's not my job to know what you want to talk about on my exactly. show exactly Yes. <laughs> you know? Yes. So, yeah. Like, I love that you said that. That is like my favorite tip. Everybody listening needs to go write that down. And to make that, make sure your topics are not generic too. That's yeah. a, I'm a big per, like, don't just say I'm an author. Yes. We know a lot of people are authors. <laughs> We're authors too. Yeah. What is it that is so unique to you? That's why I always say like, it, it, don't say you talk about, oh, I'm a six figure entrepreneur. Yeah, everyone, their mother is nowadays. So (laughs) what is it that is unique? You know, was it your journey to becoming a six-figure entrepreneur? You know, are you really even an entrepreneur? I'm not a fan of the word anymore. (laughs) It used to be that you invented something and now it means something else. So really give something unique to those topics and don't let them be generic so that others can speak on them. How can we figure out what's unique about us? How can we figure out what those things might be? You mentioned like the journey and stuff, but... When we do things easily or when we have like a skill or a talent, it's often quite difficult to see that as having any value. So what do you have any tips or tricks for listeners to yes. help them pick out their, their interesting You can points? go buy my book. No, <laughs> <laughs> because I do. I go through and I ask questions for each topic. I, I identify um, a type of topic and I relate it to a type of friend you have. So you have the one friend who you've known since you were five and they know everything about you. And it could be two years that you don't talk. Then you pick up the phone and you pick up right where you left off. And that's your personal journey. So it, it's looking into what has brought you, what events have gone on in your life that have brought you to where you are today. Then look at how you do the work you do. That's your skills or your framework, your method. You know, what is it that's unique to you? So for me, it's, you know, that I have these in-depth conversations Plus I stalk my clients. I look, I don't just look at their website. I Google them and I keep going until page five, page six to see what's out there. And then it's a combination of taking that and then looking at the host's website and then looking at their show, reading the description of the show and combining the two of those. And that's how I work my my framework, my method. So asking yourself these questions of how is it that I do what I do? And I know that this is the hardest part because this was chapter one for me. And I had to figure out how is it that I do what I do that I can write it down so someone else can replicate it. So yeah. I know this is like the hardest part. It was hard for me to write down what I do. It'll be hard for you too. But really when you step back and, and think about okay, this is what I do for my job. How do I do it? Step by step, day by day, what is it that you do? Look at a competitor and how do they do it? And what do you do differently? And then you can really easily identify what those specific skills are that sets you apart. And I do that all the time. I will stalk the competitors to see how I stand out. So I think this makes a lot of sense for nonfiction authors. I think that when you are a nonfiction author, quite often you are solving a problem, you have an expertise in a particular area. But Mm -hmm. what about authors who are writers of novels and fiction? Like, how does this correlate for them? A lot of it is, again, looking at yourself and 
what has been your journey before you wrote this novel? What did you do? Did you wake up out of bed after you graduated high school and you're like, I'm going to write a novel. Poof, that was it. Chances are no. So what has your background looked like? How did you get to the point that you are now publishing a book? And share that with us. You know, what is it that you do in your day job? What parts of the book are nonfiction? Because we all want to know that. What's real life in there that you can share? You know, that won't get you in trouble. Uh, <laughs> you know, you won't risk putting other people on display. But what is it that about that's about you that you've put in the book that we can all relate to as well? You know, there was um, in February, I had a friend who put out her first book and there's a character who has an eating disorder. Well, her job is a therapist who specializes in eating disorders. So right away, she can say that, you know, this is my expertise and this is how I did it um, in order for the book to be realistic and for it to be also not just an entertaining thriller, but now it's an educational element too. So putting that out there, it, it's great because we get to know you as that person again. And what is it that has brought this to life in these characters? You know, what kind of research did you do to create this book? So we all believe that this is a real place. All of those kinds of things are things we want to hear about things that topics that we want to hear. Um, I had interviewed Genevieve Wheeler, the author of Adelaide and for her, the nonfiction parts are every tattoo that her character has are her actual tattoos. Oh, and I wow. thought that was so cool. And they're all book-based tattoos. Oh, so wow. it was just a neat little thing to hear. Like you're saying, yes, wow. I was like, yes, wow, that's so cool. You know, let that be a part of what you're pitching. So we get to know you as that person. And then we'll want to buy your book later. <laughs> yeah, yes. So much of this is like, so one of the things that I hear people talk about often is that books are doors, right? They open doorways to new worlds. I don't agree with that. I think books are mirrors. And I think that why we read is we read to feel seen and connect like on an emotionally resonant level and have ourselves reflected back at ourselves I think that is what books really are um I can't remember why I started saying this what uh what, why did I why did I even say this I don't know why I've gone off on a tangent but it, it felt connected to what you're saying anyway maybe because of the parts of us that are in the books that we write yeah yeah I think so yes I think so and therefore people are connecting with those bits because it's a mirror we get to see ourselves yes thank you for connecting my own brain yes, yes my that, mouth. and that makes total <laughs> sense why you said that and yeah <laughs> And how it connects to the person. And we want to hear you, the person in your interview. Oh, you're such a good interviewer. Thank you so much. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, dear. Okay. Well, so we've talked about um, sort of the structure. We've talked about, you know, um, the the types of things that they need in terms of like your your Spotify playlist and your media kit and, and that stuff. Um, but how do we even know like what the right podcast is? How do we know how to find the right podcast? I feel like sometimes it's more obvious for nonfiction authors, the type of podcast to pitch. Um, but how do you, yeah. So maybe you could answer that question from both the, the perspective of a nonfiction author and the perspective of a fiction author. Sure. And of course, like you said, the nonfiction part is easier because you are solving a problem for a specific group of people. So you want to find the podcasts that are reaching those specific type of people. And the method for for both types is going to be that you're going to search them on different platforms, whether it's Spotify, Apple Podcasts, you can Google whatever kind of word for that target audience plus podcasts, use Instagram, use the hashtags because that's what we're all on as hosts, you know, um, author podcasts, there you go. Now you're going to see all of these author podcasts and search by those for novel writers. You want to find out who is your ideal reader? Who is that type of person? And I get a lot of clients who are authors who think I need to be on all the literary podcasts. And my question is, well, are all of the other authors going to be the ones buying your beach read? No, they they really aren't, you know, <laughs> they're there to li- to learn something from the literary perspective. So who is it that wants to read 
your beach read, whatever it is, your thriller, uh, your your financial thriller book, whatever genre it is, who is that? And how do you find those listeners so that you're not simply looking at all of the shows that only host authors, you know, unless we're talking about a show where they're hosting a bunch of different types of authors and you know that the listeners are all avid book readers and that they all want to read books in general. They're all looking for the Good Morning America pick or the Reese Witherspoon pick. That's a different type of show. But if you're, you know, say you are having a beach read, so you want to reach moms that are in their 30s or 40s. Now let's find podcasts that have those women as the audience and use those keywords to do your search and, and to do it that way. That would be how I would recommend you you look at it and and find those targets. Mm. Okay, okay. So try and think wider than just book podcast. Yes, like definitely think podcast. wider because you have more than you more to talk about than simply your book. If you're approaching the whole pitching part from you as the person, then you're going to have a lot more topics than simply your book. And we don't want you just to talk about your book because you're going to have future books. There'll be other things that come. So if you're only looking at your book and only looking at podcasts that are for authors, then you're really pigeonholing yourself into this one area, whereas there's a much broader audience that you could be pitching yourself to. How can we prepare ourselves to speak on podcasts? Like a lot of, um, authors are introverts. A lot of authors get very afraid of public speaking and okay, this isn't um, like a live stage in front of more than one person, or maybe it's uh, that I can think of one podcast that's got like several uh, people on it, but broadly speaking, it's a one-on-one conversation. And yet there's a lot of authors who'll be really, really nervous. So what can they do to be prepared to speak? And um, is there anything that we need to do differently if like for fiction versus nonfiction? I really approach it, like you said, as you're going to coffee with another person. And it's just going to be a conversation that you're having with a stranger that you just met. And give of your knowledge freely. That Don't... literally sounds like my worst fucking nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> I literally, I don't actually know why I do podcasting. Because <laughs> like, <laughs> if I were to meet you in real life, I'd be super terrified. Like, but because there's a screen in the way, I'm like, oh, come on, let's have a chit chat. Like. <laughs> So you were one of those people who did great during COVID. You were like, yeah, this is fantastic. Oh I thrived. I literally loved it. Yeah. My wife, my poor wife was so depressed because she's like, loves her team and loves like being in person. Whereas I'm like, yeah, no, I'm very happy working on my own all day long. Um, the funny thing is I would, so I was having this conversation the other day and, um, I would rather step on stage and have to speak to several thousand people than I would sit behind a desk and do a one-on-one signing with readers. Like that shit terrifies me. That's hilarious. (laughs) Isn't it Uh, hilarious? Is it it because the one-on-one means that they could give you feedback or that you have to think of questions to ask them? Yeah, I I don't. what they might ask you and it's like an unknown versus a you're prepared and you're like, this is what I'm going to say. And then I'm going to walk off and peace out. Wow. Wow. Yeah. So I see that you're highlighting my control freak tendencies <laughs> here. <laughs> um. Wow. Didn't expect this. <laughs> Can I just say this is the rebel part of me right now. Yeah. I'm going to just tell you that right now. This is it. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, I feel like you might be onto something. I like, I think, yeah, I think you might be onto something. The stage is very controlled, right? I know that I can, I, I know that nobody can talk back. Um, well, I mean, I can be heckled, but I'll just heckle back. Uh, you know, it's, it is, and it's done and dusted afterwards. Whereas like, I have to socially interact with people when they're like, but, and then, then it's like, I, yeah, I don't know what they're going to say. I don't know what to say to them. Like, I just find it very difficult. I find peopling hard. (laughs) And the funny thing is everybody thinks I'm an extrovert because I'm so like, well, I do a podcast. As you say, you're good at it. Yeah, I can do the stage bit. I just don't don't come and talk to me. (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> no, no, no signings afterwards, everybody. <laughs> Sorry. I'm off limits. I have another engagement. Oh, uh, no. Do you know what? It, it's funny because I can do it and I do do it. Like, because in, invariably, if you're at a conference and you've spoken, people come up to you and I do love it. Don't get me wrong. I actually love it, but it, it drains me. Sure. Whereas the stage bit gives me energy. So I can do it and it's fine. And I like giving back and doing that in all seriousness. But that bit is expensive energetically. Mm -hmm. No, I totally get that. Because I love a microphone in my hand. Like, you want me to MC your event? Give it to me. I am there and I will heckle you before you can heckle me. (laughs) That is totally my jam. And yet like this heckling wouldn't really be appropriate. So... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> it's not the same. I, yeah. I get it. And yeah. it is draining to, yeah. because you are, you have to be more focused, I think too. Yeah. You're paying attention to each yeah. other. You really have to be engaging versus I'm just going to show up and be me. And exactly. Par- prance around the yeah. stage like a twat. That's basically my whole yes. kind of shindig. Like, so yeah. Okay. So I um, completely interrupted you, but uh, I was asking about like preparation, I think. Well, yeah, I think I was asking <laughs> yeah, about preparation. You were, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, um, and I don't even know where I left off on, Just oh, it, it, was, again. It's fine. <laughs> it was that you should just approach it. Like it's a conversation, um, with oh, one yeah. person and you were like, yeah, no, no um, <laughs> yeah, that was the bit that threw me, <laughs> yeah. but that is how you should approach it. Don't think of all the other people that will be listening in. Um, just pretend like nobody's going to listen. So that way, you know, it's, it's more calming. I found for most people, it's more calming to think that way you would be a different little basket <laughs> that I'd have to put you into. Um, but Fruit loop you know, basket. That's where you yes, put me. Yeah. Yes, I'm going to put you in a little basket over there. <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, think about what is it you're going to talk about. And if there is a key point, and this is something I work with clients after hearing their story and I go, oh, that part, please mention that part. Put it on a post-it and put it on your monitor because nobody's going to see it, but it'll trigger your memory to speak about it because a host is not going to know that they should ask you about this certain part of your journey if you haven't mentioned it somewhere else. And yet it might be a story that is the key to bringing the listeners in even more. So, you know, post yourself a reminder, take some breaths, listen to episodes before And get familiar with the host because then you'll know what to expect. You'll know if you can cuss. (laughs) You will know if if there's a certain question that's going to be asked at the end of every show. These are things that you can then expect. And to me, knowing what's coming is more relaxing. Um, Although I do love winging it too. And I'm just like, ask me what you want. Let's see where it goes. I don't care. Um, But I'm in another basket myself. So... (laughs) You know, figuring that out, listen to the host, see what they're like, and then you can be prepared for what might be coming. You've mentioned a couple of times about telling stories Mm -hmm. and obviously (laughs) authors are natural storytellers. Mm -hmm. However, when it then comes to telling stories like about our life, we do one of two things. Either we think they're not interesting because they're not interesting or they are interesting, but we sort of meander and we and we you know me trying to tell watching me and my wife try and communicate is hilarious because she has ADHD so I will get interrupted 13 times before I finish the story and at which point I've then told 17 other stories because she sent me off on tangents but that's not great for a podcast so how can we tell stories I want stories? to come over for happy hour okay <laughs> <laughs> oh dear how can we like know what stories to take or and then how do we structure those to be concise enough but also engaging enough on a podcast well I think we all whether we're authors or just simply human beings think that our stories aren't interesting and yet as humans we're all creatures of nature who want to hear the stories of others that's why we love at least I do eavesdropping on the table next to me. I want to hear what's going on. And it might be something so simple, but you're like, oh, I'm so glad I'm not alone because that happened to me too. It's really just being open and honest about your story, first of all, you know, sharing as much as you can without all the little minuscule details of like, well, I wore white socks that day. (laughs) Like, does that really apply? Is your story about socks? Yes. Then, okay, yes, to mention that. But 
you know, I think as you retell a story over and over, you start to learn, especially when you can see the other person you're talking to of what's interesting, what really clicks and resonates and paying attention to those cues of, you know, does this story fit also what you're talking about? Or does it have absolutely nothing to do with the topic that you went on to the show? Figuring those ones out. I put in my book, like you can write down your stories, write them down, jot down your ideas, go back, you know, expand on them some more. And then you'll start to see, oh, you know what? Yeah, that does tie in really nicely with this topic. And I can do this practice, practice on a friend, practice on your partner, do a mock interview. Oh yeah, I love, yeah, I love that. (laughs) I hate that. And I love it because like, it really does work, but also it's the most awkward cringe thing in the world. Like I used to do mock interviews, uh, like before I went for a job interview back when I thought I could work for people. And, um, uh, yeah, it's like the most cringy thing, but actually it does. It really, that reenacting really does help. Um, I wanted to ask, you mentioned earlier on about a mistake that people make pitching the book instead of themselves. Are there any other mistakes you see people make? making maybe when they're newer to pitching um that they could avoid i have so many mistakes <laughs> i have seen i included them in the book um <laughs> from follow-ups your timing podcast hosts have full-time jobs this is very rarely someone's full-time job so to follow up within 24 hours of your pitch is wrong don't do it Give them two or three weeks and then reply to the pitch that you sent so that they have your original email there. They don't have to search and go, wait, who's Michelle? What what was she doing? I didn't see. Just pull it all together. Reply to go to your sent, hit reply, and then it'll go to them again. And be gentle in it of I'm simply following up. See if you have any questions. I do two follow-ups for every pitch and I leave two to three weeks in between them. That, that way it, you're being gentle, you're politely persistent. That's what I've been referred to as uh, and, and make it sound smart and relevant. I've gotten re- follow-ups that simply said Bing, B-I-N-G exclamation mark. I don't know what that means, but it got in the book. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, I, I have received pitches that are like a mile long. And yes, they tell me everywhere that this person has been with every single link. Well, if you just put it in the media kit, it would have all been in a one pager, not this now five page email if I had printed it out. Be concise, but include everything that you could possibly include with hyperlinks and then a media page. Um, You know, make sure that the podcast gets, they accept guests, that it's not a solo show because otherwise you're now wasting their time and your time and it just looks sloppy. Don't copy and paste. You'd be surprised not only at how many people copy and paste literally the same thing. I love your podcast. It's so great. Here's why I'd be a great guest. You're like, you don't even know who I am. You don't know what the show's about. I can tell you've copied and pasted and the podcast industry is very small. A lot of us know each other and we will talk and we will follow each other and we will post that you just got this pitch and then we'll post part of it. And you would be surprised how many people are going, I just got the same pitch. Yep, me too. Got it. Well, now we all know you copied and pasted to all of us and we all know. So it's an automatic no, at least it is for me. Uh, Those would be the big don't do these things. Be genuinely yourself, give of your knowledge in the pitch, just as you're going to give in the interview. And that's really what's going to get the yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I love that. Um, All right. We're in 2024. We're in the age of developing AI. We're in the age of um, mass consumption, um, attention, well, deficits where attention, um, it's an attention game. Do you think that podcast tours kind of being a guest on multiple podcasts still work? Do you think that um, it can work for fiction and nonfiction and really make a difference within launching a book in 2024? I do. And and when it comes to AI, I say go away from it um, unless you're repurposing something that's already put out there. Do not use it to create your new material or your pitch. I have practiced I wanted to see this example because I saw an agency say, we've incorporated AI into our pitching process. So I took myself 
as the guest and I pitched myself to my own show. And you'd be surprised where I have been interviewed and I didn't even know I'd been interviewed there. It was completely false. It, it was horrific. So don't do that. Don't use AI to create your pitch. There's a lot of noise in the media. There's new platforms. There's old platforms that are imploding. There's all of these different things. But I think that podcasts still bring people together. It's still the opportunity for us to listen to the stories of others and to really get to know people that we wouldn't otherwise. Even if they're on the news and being interviewed, it's only a, a minute to two minute to three minute clip. Whereas this is a 30, 60 minute conversation where you get to truly hear from another person. You get their voice in your ear. You get to hear what they've been through, how they do what they do. And so I truly feel it does still move the needle when it comes to buying books. You know, we're seeing more and more authors now be interviewed because also it's going to save them money in the end from having to get on a plane, book a hotel, get the rental car, show up, and then, oh, one person showed up to my event. If you're sitting for 30 minutes, you could be reaching hundreds and thousands of people in those 30 minutes from the comfort of your own home. So definitely it, I see it as being worth it and it is helping. Do you have any other kind of final tips and tricks to help um, authors be in, in, in interviewed? Like, do you see any people doing anything quirky that kind of like, you know, uh, helps to elevate their appearance on a podcast? I think it definitely helps to have your book cover somewhere. Um, this was hanging on the wall. I, I was at an event, but, you know, to have something that shows your book in the background that isn't like, let me hold it up for you all to see, but it's simply in the background. That's been a big deal. That's That's been really great that I've seen. Uh, and then really just sharing it. Please share the interviews, not on your Instagram stories for 24 hours, but promote it. Put it in your Instagram feed, put it on X, Twitter, threads, LinkedIn, put it on your website. You know, you can create show notes and do transcripts, pull quotes from yourself and truly share the interview because then your followers will see it. Maybe they haven't gotten to hear from you and hear your story. And you're also now thanking the host for having you on by sharing that interview, tagging them. They will then reshare it and it becomes a bigger ripple effect. So it might not be quirky. And yet the fact that not everybody's doing it, then you do get to be the quirky one because you're doing it. Yeah, and it also makes you much more likely to be invited back. Yes, I have had. So I had posted on threads last week, two totally different posts. One was about um, podcast hosts complaining that guests are not sharing it. And then another one was guests complaining that they don't know when an episode goes live because the host isn't telling them. And from the host side, I said, well, are you vetting your your guests? Are you looking at what they've shared before, because that's going to tell you right there if your expectations are too high because they've never shared another interview. And I had one host go, well, that's a great idea. I'm going to start looking. Why wouldn't you see if they're sharing? And if you are sharing, then you have no problem or worry if, if a host is checking that because you are sharing so they can know that, yes, you will share my interview too. It's a yes. And on you know the host side, yeah, there are some hosts that just don't tell you it's gone live. I had two out of four last week. Didn't even tell me. So I don't do it, but my virtual assistant does it. And once the that's once all the that matters. Scheduled, yeah, somebody exactly. says somebody yeah, as long does as it. Somebody does it. <laughs> well, we send all the links and the graphics as well. We like make it easy for them, right? Like we don't write as the do copy I. for you, but we you know we send you all the information. So like that, and and that, and I do that because. Like, I know not everybody will share, but I hope that they'll share. You know, like if if I'm giving the platform, hopefully it's reciprocated. <laughs> well, to me, that's how we say thank you is you right. had me in your home and you've extended the trust that your listeners have given to you to me now. So how do I say thank you? Well, I share it with all of my followers so that then they'll come and listen to you too. It's so simple and yet... People aren't doing it. So yeah. we need some industry standards around this. And hopefully this episode, the book will all help encourage people to increase those standards. So our expectations are finally being met. <laughs> Amazing. Well, 
This is the Rebel Author Podcast. So tell everyone about a time you unleashed your inner rebel. I would have to say it's been since I've had my children. I became like this mama bear, like the true what you, you know, how women say this of like, I became a mother and then there was something unleashed in me. And that was when I truly feel like I found my voice and the whole fuck it. I'm going to tell you what I think. I'm going to let you know what my opinions are. And even though I'm going to say that they were right, <laughs> I think that what I believe is right um, across the board, per se, um, that's been like the most rebellious because we have so many people proclaiming that I'm authentic. And if you say you're authentic, you're really not authentic. And yet nobody wants to really speak their truth and what their opinion is because we don't want to rock the boat. And I feel like that's been my rebel moment is simply been motherhood of I'm not going to stand for this, whatever it is, and I'm going to tell you how it is, and I'm going to vote for this politician, and this is why, and really just speaking my truth in my voice, that's been my rebel almost a decade now. <laughs> I love that, and I think it's one of the most important things that we can do, and I think that is what fosters true connection as well, so I love that. I, I really love that. Um, would you like to tell everyone where they can find out more about you, uh, your book and anything else that you'd like to add as well? Thank you. Yes. My agency is the MLG collective.com and my personal website is michelleglogovac.com. I'm on all of the platforms. Instagram's Michelle Glogovac, Threads, X is Mick Glogovac because the name's too long. I'm on LinkedIn. Uh, my show is My Simplified Life and it is everywhere that you listen to podcasts. It's on Tuesdays. And then the book How to Get on Podcasts is available everywhere, hardcover, ebook, and audiobook. And I narrate that. So if you love the voice, get the audiobook. <laughs> oh, I love it. I love it. Well, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. And of course, a giant thank you to all of the show's listeners and all of the show's patrons. If you would like to get early access to all of the episodes, you can do so by visiting patreon.com forward slash Sasha Black. I'm Sasha Black. You are listening to Michelle Glogovac, and this was the Rebel Author Podcast. Next week, I'm joined by Mariella S. Smith, and we are talking all about how to write using tarot. So join me next week for that. Don't forget to tune in and subscribe on your podcatcher. And when you have a moment, please leave a review.